I'm not a writer. I'm not a historian. I'm an engineer. What motivated me to write this book is that when I read about Dona Gracia, I was infatuated by her. I have never been able to compare her equally to anybody I ever knew from all the books we read, from the Torah, from the religious books. I have never seen any person like her. When I started comparing her with great women in the past, with Sarah, with Esther, with uh, all the biblical characters, they did great things. But what she did for a core religionist is, I find, much more. I thought, I forgot about women. I decided to look at the whole world, humanity. Who has ever done, which person has ever done something as important as her? And I came across, of course, Martin Luther King. He uh, worked very hard for people of his own uh, race, and uh, he helped them, he, he sacrificed his life for them. So he's a great man, I respect him highly. He's done a fantastic job. There is even uh, Martin Luther King Day in America, so it's been very important um, for the dignity of uh, black people. Dona Gracia has done this to her own people. She tried to save the lives of people from the Inquisition. She sacrificed her life also, like Martin Luther King. She did two extra things which Martin Luther King didn't do. First thing, she was a very rich lady. She was a banker. And all the kings and emperors needed bankers at the time. She was one of the biggest bankers in Europe. Today, perhaps you could compare them difficultly with, much bigger than Rothschilds, bigger than perhaps Rockefeller, I don't know. There was one of the biggest bankers in the world. So all the emperors and, and uh, kings needed her money whenever they wanted to do something extra. So she was welcome in all the palaces. She could live a life of luxury, the unimaginable luxury that no other person could live, she sacrificed that. L Martin Luther didn't have this opportunity. Second thing, she used her own money. Luther used the community money to make all the meetings, all the uh, work that he's, he's, led, it, he's led. So, uh, Dona Gracia on these two accounts has done what Martin Luther King has done. Even with two additional very important uh, things. So, um, of course, she's not recognized. She's not known well enough. The world didn't recognize her uh, well enough. In fact, Israel, with Shimon Peres, only recognized her as being the first person who dreamt, not only dreamt, even bought a land where she tried to assemble all her coalitionists in a land where they could rule their own, their own selves. Dona Gracia had in her the ideal of saving people from the Inquisition. And ultimately, the safest land in the whole world on the 16th century was the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was a land where people were free to pray the way they want. They could uh, express their religious feelings freely, openly. Uh, so this was unthinkable in the Catholic world of the 16th century, where uh, many were converted. The ones that remained Jews were either in ghettos or were oppressed very much. In the Ottoman Empire, uh, the minorities paid a small tax called jizye. And once they paid that tax, the emperor, the Ottoman Emperor, was obliged, it was an option for him, he was obliged to protect them, to give them all the liberties he promised. And these liberties um, always remained intact in the Ottoman Empire. Particularly during the five most important emperors of the Ottoman Empire, uh, these liberties were expressed to the limit. Of course, this was a dream uh, for uh, oppressed people in the West, in Europe. And Dona Gracia was uh, their leader, their dream leader. She was a dreamer that always imagined a land where they would be able to protect themselves freely and live freely. Of course, 
Jerusalem was her highest biggest dream. Like it is, it has always been the dream of Jews, one day to go back to Jerusalem. And uh, of course, the reason for that is that after the expulsion for 3,000 years, Jews have been airing all over the world and have been used like uh, the golden calf. They've been always in every crisis, uh, be it an economic uh, crisis or a health problem, uh, uh, an epidemic. It, immediately Jews would be shown as the reason for that epidemic or for the economic crisis. And so Jews have been uh, pushed around for thousands of years after the expulsion. So the dream is to go back to the old days when Jews could live freely and protect themselves with uh, their arms in their hands, rather than give their protection to somebody else who would abuse it eventually. So she had this dream, and of course the Ottoman Empire housed the four most important religious uh, uh, sites in the world. These are uh, Jerusalem, Hebron, Safed, and Tiberias. She wanted, of course, she dreamt about Jerusalem, but if she asked for Jerusalem from Suleiman the Magnificent, he would immediately think that these people have an eye on my land, and this would not go well with the emperor. So she opted, of course, for the second. Hebron is inside. Jerusalem and it's too small to harbor all the people in suffering in Europe. Then Safed, already there was an Ottoman force in Safed, so it wouldn't be proper to ask for Safed. Tiberias remained only. So uh, what she did, she spoke with uh, Suleiman the Magnificent, told her about her worries, about her concerns, and said that she wants to bring all the people suffering in Europe to Tiberias. They made an agreement. She agreed to pay certain sums of money, and against these sums of money, there will be an independent, uh, well, semi-dependent state in Tiberias. They worked very hard with Joseph Nasi to build the walls around Tiberias. They spent a lot of money, and there were a lot of fights going on, because many people spread the word that if there is a Jewish kingdom in Tiberias, the Islam faith will suffer heavily. So the Muslim workers that were working on the wall refused to work. And this was brought to the attention of the emperor, Suleiman I, and he sent orders immediately to restore uh, people to continue to work. The governor of the land came and hanged two of the workers that refused to work. Immediately everybody started to work and today you see the walls of Tiberias, if you've been there, you will see a fantastic wall that was constructed uh, with the efforts of Dona Gracia and Joseph Nassi. Joseph Nassi became such an important character in the Ottoman Empire that the decision of conquering Cyprus was his idea. He is the one that explained that uh, it was important to conquer uh, Cyprus. Sokuldo Mehmet, who was the son-in-law of the emperor, who was also the prime minister, the Sadr Azam, prime minister at that time, had all the rights of the emperor, and he had the seal, so he could come, all the laws could come out through him, he could do anything he wanted. Although he was so powerful, Sokuldo was one of the most important prime ministers in Ottoman history, what Joseph Nasi said, always was considered uh, more than Sokullo. For example, conquering Cyprus was Joseph Nasi's idea. He was backed by Piale Pasha, Lala Mustafa Pasha, even Ebu Suut Efendi, the, the chief religious person in the country, supported Joseph Nasi. So, in, sp in spite of Sokullo's objections, Kibris, uh, Cyprus was uh, conquered and taken. This is the reason why still Cyprus is partly Turkish. It's because of Joseph Nasi. Uh, they're amazing characters. I mean, I, I really, the more I re learn about them, the more, as I was writing, of course, I got more and more information. And uh, it's, it's a unending well. And it's part of Ottoman history. I think it's part of world history. And in my books, you travel to, to the 16th century, Europe, which is also a fascinating part. Uh, I think it's the most important history, 
uh, the most important um, period in the world history. This century is really where everything happened. What happened? America was discovered in the 16th century. Uh, the trade routes changed completely, which created Europe in a way. The third thing, Renaissance took place in the 16th century. Reformation in religion took place in the 16th century. Also, the press was discovered in the 16th century. That was already, it made a huge change. Imagine, there were no newspapers. There were no musical books. Books were written by hand, and it was very expensive, so musicians couldn't buy them easily. Uh, reformation couldn't be without the press because the information couldn't be distributed so much. New ideas, Lutheran ideas, wouldn't be distributed so easily. So this is a fascinating century. And uh, going through my books, you are really traveling through a 16th century. Although uh, our uh, principal characters, Dona Gracia and Rolf Nancy, are taking you through a century, you are really uh, experiencing how life from her mouth uh, develop in these uh, periods. Also historically, on the 16th century, you had two very, very important emperors. One of them was Charles V, the other one was Suleiman the Magnificent. These were the most powerful people in the world. They were the ones that held the largest uh, amount of land in the world on the 16th century. So you see also the power struggle between them. She was a banker. Bankers were very important. So, emperors and kings always needed money. They didn't have a budget, they didn't have this budgetary concept yet. So they would just spend and spend until suddenly somebody will tell them, I'm sorry, we don't have enough money to go to war or to buy, you know, build an army. So he would say, go to the bankers. So they had to get on very well with the bankers. The bankers, today the bankers are important perhaps in the world, but at that time they were determinant because there were not too many of them that could land at their own uh, the levels of emperors and kings. And uh, there were really three bankers which are important to mention. One of them is the Fuggers, the Habsburgs bankers, the bankers of the Holy Roman Emperor. Dona Gracia, Mendes House, also Affiatati, the Italians. Also Wesley's also on a more minor scale, I think. So you had these three, you have a very operatic scene where you have two emperors, three bankers, and that's Europe for you, nearly. This is where the, the powerhouse is. So it's really fascinating uh, 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 century, which really always intrigues me very much. And uh, in my book, I'm really concentrating on the 16th century. I have translated, I, I tried to have my book translated, I worked with a few translators and I couldn't maintain the soul of the book. The book has been very popular in Turkey, it has been read very widely, 25,000 people read the book in Turkey. Uh, it's my first book and normally what I hear in the States is that if your first book says 1,000, it's a miracle. So I think people found something in the book, something historical information, which is really given in a taste of Dan Brown's book, let's say. So it was easy to read, but there's a lot of information which is well-researched. It has its own uh, foundations in history. Um, as, as I went more and more into this part of the history, I discovered many more things which I uh, generously use in my books. And uh, I think uh, I, I had it translated, uh, I, as I said, I couldn't find a good translator that will uh, keep the soul of the book, so I, did I made the translation myself. Uh, and then I sent it to uh, uh, my editor in Berkeley, in California, in my old school. And uh, she's, I think, doing a very meticulous work, job with it. I expect very soon to receive uh, the edited book. Uh, I already had uh, discussion with publishers, distributors in the States. Also, I'm planning uh, PR work also to get people to know a little bit more about my uh, work. 
uh, and I hope in the, by the end of this year to be able to be published in the United States and I hope it will be also received as well as it has been received in uh, Turkey. Of course, uh, it will first be published in all the English-speaking languages, England, Australia, New Zealand, uh, the United States, of course. Also, uh, an ambassador friend of mine is translating my book, who knows very well Turkish and Hebrew, is translating into Hebrew, Moshe Kamhi, and uh, he will, uh, so we'll have the Hebrew version soon, I hope, at hand. Um, Eventually it will be translated into Spanish, Portuguese and uh, I hope this part of history will be even better known uh, with my novels. I also have a history book that I will publish, which I think also will be a reference book. There are some very good history books uh, around, uh, but this one also I think will find its place uh, next to these books. And my novels also, I think, will be the only novels about these people that are really very easy to read and very enjoyable. Of course, uh, there is the French novel uh, written by Catherine, uh, Catherine, her family name. Really, it's a beautiful novel. I read it. I really enjoy reading it very much. But my novels are easier to read and um, as I said, in Dambran style. So when you read it, you really enjoy it. One complaint, my friends, is that I bought the book and read it in two in one day. In two days, I finished reading the book. So it really flows when you read it. I hope I'll be able to maintain the same flow in, in English also. Gracia is the most important link between Turkey and the Ottoman and Portugal. I was with a uh, culture minister, a Portuguese culture minister, together with thinking. She asked me a question. She said, what is the most important link between the two countries? And I told her about Dona Gracia's story. She said, that's amazing. We have to work on that. And I said, what can we do? Of course, I said, in Istanbul, there's a synagogue in Askeri, which she built. There's a synagogue called La Senora in Izmir. There's a Portuguese synagogue in Izmir, which was the biggest synagogue uh, of the time, meaning that there was a very big Portuguese community in Izmir at that time. So she was very interested. She uh, asked the Portuguese ambassador in Ankara to work on this project. And we went together to the Turkish Minister of Culture. We explained the importance of the connection between Turkey and Portugal of Dona Gracia. And we came to a conclusion that it will be very good to make an ex exposition that we start in Portugal, travel to all the places that Dona Gracia traveled, and make it a peace uh, exposition. So we start from Portugal, go to England, London, then go to Antwerp, from Antwerp, go to Venice. From Venice, come to Seranica Pass, come to Istanbul, of course, then from Istanbul, go to Tiberias. And uh, this will also be a cultural uh, dialogue, let's say, between all these countries because of Dona Gracia. The project uh, was uh, seen positively by both ministers. An MOU was signed between Portugal and Turkey to realize this project. But unfortunately, 16th century Ottoman language is so confusing, so difficult, very few people in Turkey can read. So the decision was that both countries will choose five professors that will research the, su the subject, create enough material, every country will pay for its own work, and then all this work will be brought together, and then the exposition will take place in Lisbon. Unfortunately, it was very difficult in Turkey to find five professors that uh, are, are versed well enough in 16th century Ottoman language that could bring up material from the archives and uh, make this project possible. We got stuck there. I didn't give up. I keep on, I spoke with our present cult minister of culture also. When, of course, these cultural things uh, are important when there's a, a very peaceful environment in the countries. 
So I hope this will happen soon, and whenever there's an opportunity, I'd like to do that. Also, my other dream is to make the Dona Gracia Synagogue in Haskell, that is in shambles, that is in ruins, to make a museum of Dona Gracia there, and so her name will be remembered forever and ever. The books I wrote, I wrote them in Turkish because there was nothing written in Turkish on them. So I consider them to be a monument. My books are a monument in Turkish, in Turkey, about Dona Gracia and Jadet Nasi.